Hi, I'm Matthew. Um, welcome to this video. This is the second in a short series of videos that I'm producing um, to help people understand how best to photograph their artwork. Um, as I said in the first video, my assumption here is that I'm talking to an audience of people who are not expert photographers and they're not surrounded by a huge extent of very expensive photographic equipment. This is more about someone who's a painter, um, a silversmith, a jeweller, uh, who wants to use photography to uh, demonstrate their art, to put it on the web, to, uh, to publicize themselves. And they probably have modest or basic camera equipment. And my aim is to show you how to use that to get good, effective results. This is the second, as I say, in the series. This one is focused on um, how to photograph 3D art um, and using minimal kit. There are going to be a lot of uh, similarities to what we talked about in the 2D art because some of the principles are the same, but there are some distinct differences. Um, what I would say is that 3D in one sense is more complicated. Uh, because the lighting challenges of trying to light around something are much harder than just lighting something flat. But at the same time, in one sense, it's also a little bit simpler in as much as the uh, issues you have with parallax where something appears to be falling forward or falling backwards because you haven't perhaps lined the camera up correctly or perhaps the work, they're less prevalent. I mean, they may still be there, but when the eye looks at a piece of 3D work, it sees it as a solid object and it's able to understand, as we do in everyday life, that things that are near us appear larger. What confuses the eye is when you're seeing something that's meant to be flat and clearly all the visual cues are that it isn't flat. Whereas so the eye is going to be much more forgiving on a piece of 3D work. Everyone knows if you put your head really close to something, the bit near you is going to look larger. So it makes it a little bit easier uh, but as I say, more complicated because how you deal with the light is, is a challenge. Now, when it comes to light, the common principles that pervade really every type of photography are that we need diffuse light, which we spoke about in the last video, i.e. light that doesn't create hard shadows. We need even light, and, and that's the bit that's so much harder to do with 3D than 2D. Um, now then, we want daylight as well. Uh, we, we don't want to be using any artificial light, we don't want to use flash from a camera because it will be too, too sharp, too hard-edged and create too many shadows. Now, there are, what I'm going to work with is this. It's another piece of work that my wife made. Uh, this is a fabric teapot. One has to be very careful not to make one's tea in this, otherwise it will just dissolve. Now, um, it's an interesting object to photograph. It's very challenging because it's white. Um, all over, that makes picking the detail out. I'll also probably use this as another example. I'll, I'll, I'll use a watch uh, because that's a, a sort of metal's very, very difficult to photograph, and you'll see some of the challenges because it's so reflective. So, those are the couple of pieces we're going to work with. Now, how you photograph 3D work uh, largely depends on the size. You, the, the effect you're trying to achieve is the same, but how you go about it varies due to size. Now, you want to create an all-around light. And what's been invented at incredibly cheap cost for photographing small bits of 3D work is one of these. Now, this is a light tent or, or a light box. Um, and it's, it's a very cheap one. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, get rid of that hair. It's um, off the web and as I say, staggeringly cheap. So it demonstrates that you actually don't need to spend a huge amount of money to, um, to photograph your, your work. So but the problem here is they come in different sizes. Now, if you're a sculptor and you're making a, a life-size bust of my head, this isn't gonna be good enough. Uh, or if you've made something bigger, a very, very tall pot, this isn't gonna be good enough. This is very good for small items. So, you know, if I take this watch, and I pop it in here, um, you can see that I'm going to be able to get a picture which doesn't go anywhere near the edges of the box, which is, which is really what we want, because we don't want hard edges, corners, we don't want those visible in the shot. Um, so it's good for small pieces of work. It is available in bigger sizes, um, and 
it gets more expensive, clearly. Now it's also available in two designs. This is the absolute cheapest design. Um, the, the other design is where the box is actually made out of a translucent white material. And what you actually do is put photographic lights outside the box and the light is diffused into the box. Now they sort of give a better result, but of course they're more expensive and of course you need some lights to do it. Whereas these, which are you know, pretty cheap, are a pretty good start. Now they come in a, a case, I mean this one doesn't have a brand on it, you can go on the web, there are lots available, and they usually come, they fold flat. You can see that there's a whole load of poppers down the side, which means you can just put it together. Now, I'll get rid of the case, and they come with these backdrops, usually available in a series of colours. I've got the white one in at the moment where I was struggling to get that, that bit of fluff off. Um, a red one, a green one, a black one. And they just clip in at the top, uh, which I'll try and show you. The green one is, is for chroma key work, because you can use that if you want to do sort of like what the weathermen do, which is where they stand in front of a green screen and then they superimpose a background on it. That's where they give you a green. You might be wondering, when would I ever photograph with that? The black is clearly very useful. I, I'm not so sure about the red, um, but the white is probably the most common. Now, the other great thing about these, you'll love this because you get a lot for your money, and I don't know whether you can see, but there's actually two rows of LED lights in there. Um, and so this one is effectively self-illuminating. Now I do think it does create a rather blue light. Now it's powered off a USB, uh, so I'm just using an ordinary phone charger and I'll just bend down and plug it in. Uh, the usual problem, which is making sure the plug goes in the right way. Now there we go. So look, we have a really nice blue light in there. Now, the other thing that you get with, uh, with one of these is you get a little removable hole at the top. Now, that's because sometimes it's just very good to photograph your work downwards. You know, you're going to get a very, and, and perhaps we'll do that with the watch. We'll perhaps take one either way and, and we'll give you a little useful cover with a bit of Velcro. Now, look, it's not the world's most stable piece of equipment, but it will do the job. Now, um, it, this particular one is probably, I think I've seen it on the web, for about £12. So you can see that you can get started very easily. I think as you fold it up many times, there's an argument it might become a bit easy to use. It's a sort of plastic, so it sort of fights you when you're trying to put it together. Um, but I mean, it's sort of throwaway really at that price. You could use it a few times and you wouldn't be too worried um, if, it, if it got damaged. So look, the important things I wanted to just get across is available in many sizes, um, also available in a translucent material where you use external lights. Now, if your work is very large, like we said, perhaps a bust or perhaps a very tall pot, this isn't really gonna work. What you're going to have to do is create an aversion of this yourself, uh, you know, out of pieces. And what you have to do really is you're gonna need some white sheets, you're going to need to drape, okay, maybe get out a few boxes and create a sort of white background that can go around your work. Do it on a table with a white cloth coming over it and then put the work on it. And then you will have to use either daylight. I mean, again, I'm near the window. I've put the table facing this way, but it would be just as easy to work with the table the other way, uh, making the best use of the daylight. So that would be a good way uh, to, to cope with a bigger piece of work. Now then, um, backdrops. You're, you're probably not going to want to put your work just on that sort of horrible white surface. Um, with the way these are designed, and I'll just pick up one of the backdrops to show you, it's a bit of a shame really that they fold them in half to put them in the case. Uh, they have this little tab at the top which just clips in and holds it to the back. Um, what, you, what you really want in photography world is you want the back and the fore to not really have a crease. Um, you really want to be able to just have a sweeping curve. But because they folded these, it makes it a little bit difficult. So if you look in there, you'll see that there is... Oh, that's really nice. What is it? That's, um, that's a very cheap connector, isn't it? But you'll see that the crease at the back is a little bit visible, which I don't like because... Photographs of work like this always look better if you can't really see where the floor or the back begins or finishes. But what I'm going to do, you know, this is stuff you probably don't need me to explain to you. I've got a bit of an odd box there, so I can pop that box in there. That's because I want to stand the work off the floor 
And then I've got a sort of nice contrasting blue cloth. Now, this has been ironed. You know, remember when you're shooting at this level of detail, every little flaw is going to be visible. So if you haven't ironed it or it's covered in fluff, then you're going to have some problems. So I've just put that box in there in a sort of fairly square way. And then I'm going to pop the teapot, uh, which again has got sort of all sorts of odd bits of thread and very, it's very, very textured. And you've got to think a little bit about the angle. Now, when you come to photograph this, I'll just jump to the other side. What you sort of don't want to do is you don't want to catch these creases that are in the back where the corners meet because they're going to look ugly. So it's probably a case of shooting from the front. You'll see with the watch, which is much smaller, takes up less space, goes less near the edges. We have much more scope of, uh, of what we could photograph or angles we could photograph from. So what I do is I'll do both. I'll use my phone and I'll use my camera and we'll take a couple of quick shots, which of course then in the next video, I'm going to show you how to edit. And um, I'll talk a little bit, trying to be consistent throughout these videos and make sure I re you know, repeat the really important information. Um, if you're using an SLR, um, this, the, in this case, you're going to want to uh, make sure you're on a 60th or 125th of a second. Uh, I generally tend to work in shutter priority mode because um, that's a fixed for me. I don't want things to shake and vibrate. So that's the sort of, um, that's the sort of uh, speed I want to work at. You, you want to get the highest f-stop you can, f11, f16, maybe even f22 if it will go to it. So the problem you're gonna have with small work is that when the lens is focused, it's focused on one point on this teapot let's say here. As you increase that aperture size, i.e. the number gets bigger, and you go f11, f16, f22, what is happening is the amount of picture that is in focus is increasing. So from the back to the front, more of it is coming into focus. Now that doesn't really matter that much when we're photographing a flat piece of work. That's why we sort of use f8, because you've given yourself enough, this is called depth of focus or depth of field, you're giving yourself enough leeway so that if you haven't focused the camera perfectly, the whole image will be sharp. So much harder with something like this, and of course harder still with something even bigger, because to get the back and the front in focus is very, very challenging. There are some techniques which professionals use to overcome that, which I can perhaps cover in a later video. So when I um, put this in here and photograph it, I'm gonna focus sort of on the midpoint, probably somewhere here around the lid, and I'll know that some behind will be in focus and some in front will be in focus. So as I say, I'm gonna use a 60th or 125th. I'm gonna to aim to get the smallest f-stop I can, uh, the, which is the largest number. Uh, it's always confusing in photography because as the hole that the aperture makes gets smaller, the numbers go up. Um, and to do that, to make sure the exposure is right, I'm gonna move the ISO up, uh, which is increasing the camera sensitivity. Now, it isn't usually too challenging to get those sort of uh, parameters that I've just discussed because this box has actually got quite a lot of light in it. I mean, it's quite bright even compared to the window. So it's not usually too challenging. Now, I haven't really photographed pictures whilst I'm on here before on the video, but I'll do it quickly. I mean, I can tell you that I'm on 1600 ISO and my camera is telling me that I can take that at 125th of a second uh, around about f22. That is really, really lovely. I'm going to get a good sharp image. So I'm, I'm going to take that. Uh, I'll take it quickly. I'll just take a couple. And these are going to be the pictures that we will use uh, when we're um, in the editing software. Um, now, I'm also going to take some more, uh, this process of taking many pictures, uh, so that when you get to the editing software, you're sure that you've got one that you like. So I'm also going to take a couple where I'm going to go to a smaller f-stop, a lower number, a bigger hole. Uh, I'm going to come down to about f8 uh, and take one. Um, and then I'm also going to take another one at sort of probably even, well, probably 5.6. Um, there we go. Now the reason I'm doing that is that, uh, as I've explained, as you make the hole bigger and the number gets smaller, 
the depth of focus is shrinking like this. Uh, so less of the, the teapot is going to be in focus. But what that's quite useful for is it will make the background look more out of focus. And the more out of focus the background is, the better this is going to look. So you're actually trying to achieve the impossible. You want as much of the teapot in focus and as little as the background in focus. So that's why it's worth just messing around and taking two or three shots. Now, that's going to be um, more challenging on your phone. I will take a couple of shots using my Android phone, uh, using the standard camera function. And again, I've got the grid enabled and I've also got the level enabled. But, uh, you know, as I said when we started, it matters less about parallax and perspective issues because this is a 3D item and the eye can immediately see that it's something round. Um, so I'll just take a couple, but this is uh, way more wide angle than I would like to be. So it is unfortunately including an awful lot of the box. Um, and of course, you know you've got this nice feature on your phone where you can um, just tap on the screen and that's what it will focus on. So I'll just take that. Of course, I've got the flash off and I've disabled all of those scene detection modes where it tries to work out whether I'm on a beach or whether I'm in a nightclub when clearly I'm in here trying to photograph something, uh, a fabric teapot, a very common scene that uh, they haven't accounted for. Now, I don't think the teapot's going to look great photographed from the top, but what we'll quickly do is we'll swap it and we'll um, pop the watch on. Now, this highlights something you've got to think about and in point, points out a prop that I've missed. So I'll just go and collect a box, another box. So this is an old cartridge box from my printer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually raise, oh dear, I've sort of messed the blue cloth up. I wanted to keep it folded. Um, okay, let's just pop that there. What I want to do is I want to lift the box at the back because the watch is going to be uh, it's not going to look good flat. It needs to be tipped up. So I'll lay the blue cloth back over the top. That sort of looks okay. Now, I'm, you know, I'm not arty enough to be able to lay this out in a, a really, truly... Oh, I've never it tipped up so much that it's going to fall off. So I'm just going to have to ease it back a little bit. And these are all the sort of fiddly things that you have to deal with um, when you're trying to do this type of work. Um, it does keep sliding down, so I'm going to lower it a little bit more. Right, there we go. Now, that I, I accept that's not the most elegant shot, but you can see that uh, it's brightly lit. It will actually look quite nice when it's photographed. So if you're making jewellery, this, this, this sort of size of box would work really well for you. So um, I, I'll get in and take a couple of close-ups. And again, I'm going to use... Um, some similar sort of thinking. I'm going to take one at f5.6, I'm going to take another one at f8, another one at f11, and I'm just going to push it to f16. Um, now, at every point, I'm focusing sort of on the middle of the watch and hoping that I, you know, I've got a range of depth of fields that will, will cope with that. Now, I think it would probably be appropriate that we, we have a look at you know, what it's going to come out like. And the key, of course, is you have to keep the strap out of the way. And I probably need a step ladder so that I can get above this. Now, that's a sort of fairly standard part of my photogra photographic armoury. But would you believe it, I don't actually have it here now. So I'm just going to focus this up. And then uh, just fire a couple of shots off, uh, looking from above. Now, while we're here, we'll, um, we'll take uh, a couple using the phone so that we've got some comparative shots. And then I think lastly, I'm just going to talk a little bit about white balance um, and then just sort of recap on a couple of points. So let's get this one uh, taken here. Um, I think the problem I'm going to have with this is that it's sort of too much blue cloth at the back and not enough at the front. Uh, you know, I need, for my picture, I need to make sure I've got it sort of fairly even. So I'm just pulling it forward a bit. Um, this is good because I'll easily be able to crop out the edges. Um, so I'll be very confident that I'm getting a good result. 
So I've taken a couple of shots there. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about is white balance. Now we spoke a bit about this in video number one. And um, we introduced these cards, you remember, which are just a couple of quid on the internet. Um, with the white card, the black card, and the 18% grey card. Uh, that light in there, I would say, is a little bit bluer than daylight. You know, just doing a really visual comparison, I can see that it's a little bit bluer. So that is going to be creating a colour cast on this. So this teapot, for sure, is going to look a little bit bluer in there than it does here. It distinctly looks quite yellow here. There it looks much whiter and colder. So what I'm going to do is put a reference point in. I'm going to put this little white card in here and have it visible, but somewhere where I can either crop it out. Now, that can be a bit challenging because there's not a lot of space in there. So what you can do instead is you can take one shot that just has the white card and then move the card and take some more shots because when you are in your editing software, you'll be able to call up the picture of the white card and say to the software, this is white, and the software will tell you what the color temperature of the bulb is. And then you can use that to correct all the other images. So I know this sounds a bit sort of scientific and a bit OTT, but for a couple of quid, you're, you're massively improving your chances of getting a correct color balance. Now you might well say I could use the white on the back of the, the watch, on the watch face, because that, that is a good white. Um, but for the purpose of this demo, I'll just take a picture with the white card in uh, on my camera. And oh, I'm going to just check I got the exposure on that correct. I don't think I was paying a huge amount of attention. Um, there we go, that's a little bit better. Uh, and I'm not too bothered about the focus here. I'm only after just grabbing the white card. And that's pretty much my job done. Now, I think we've covered something that's very 3D, something that's a little bit flatter and a little bit harder to photograph. Uh, you could use um, lots of different colored fabrics. You can use lots of stands to display your work to good effect. You could use these other colored backdrops that are provided. Um, but I think when you look at what I've used, which is sort of an old cigar box, a couple of bits of boxes to stand stuff on, an old scarf which I just went and stole from my wife's studio, um, a 10 to 12 pound uh, light tent, which is powered by a USB. I used a phone charger that I already had. It didn't come with one. And you know, armed with that, I built a pretty good setup for photographing 3D work. Um, I've covered the fact that you can buy this in different formats. Uh, larger, smaller, uh, you can buy the canvas version if you have some lights that you can put outside. We've talked about the importance of the depth of field and the depth of focus, which are the same thing. We've talked about the camera settings and we've talked about the importance of uh, using the, the white card to make sure you have a white reference point. So I think we've got some good pictures there. Uh, the next video is really going to be me taking the 2D shots and the 3D shots and putting them uh, into some editing software and show you how to quickly try and get some good pictures from that. Okay.